Um, welcome to our May 15th Saturday morning webinar on native plants to enhance your habitat. We have a special guest, Gail Sklar. Is that correct, Sklar? Thank you. Correct. Thank you for pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> I do my best. Um, we are going to have a great presentation. Um, those of you joining us, uh, some of you are uh, very familiar with our format. Today we're going to do a little bit different where we're going to put all your put all your questions in the Q and A or in the chat, and um, we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. We'll let Gail get through her presentation. She's got a lot of great information to share, and so we want to make sure that we are uh, getting through, uh, getting that out there, so that everyone can have uh, have a chance to hear it all. Um, Going to give everyone about four more minutes. Well, we'll say two more minutes to get joining, and then we'll get into the usual uh, presentations. Um, while we are waiting, though. Uh, Janda, do you want to talk about a few upcoming events with the um, webinars here? Okay. Um, for those that don't know, I'm the coordinator at the Enviro House, and um, our next webinar will be um, next Saturday, the 22nd, with uh, Jenny Call, who has presented several times for Garden Sphere, and she will be talking about native plants. Not native plants, I'm sorry, that's today. She will be talking about herbs and how you can grow, what to grow that, that works well in the Pacific Northwest, how to use them, how to harvest them, drying and some things like that. Um, and then the following Saturday is Memorial Day weekend. I will be on vacation the next week. Um, so we will pick up again um, 12th of June and we will have several in June. One that you folks might be interested in will be weeds how to manage weeds and pests with non-toxic solutions. And that's a really um, good opportunity to learn how not to put poisons in your yard that will um, affect the pollinators that we're trying to preserve, the birds and, and insects and butterflies and bees. So that's what's coming up. Um, we're planning July, um, probably nothing in August, but stay tuned because we have at least four, five, six more coming up. Excellent. Thank you, Janda. And we will report at the end, we'll put in the links where you can find the recorded versions of, of past. And a place to sign up for any future webinars and get information. So excellent. Um, again, yep. those of you joining us now, we um, I do encourage you to use the chat. Um, so please jump into the chat. Um, I'm going to send there. There's a little toggle that says all panelists or all panelists and attendees. Go ahead and switch that to all panelists and attendees. I'll send out a message that says, please use the chat to ask questions, or you can put them in the Q&A. Occasionally during these webinars, we also have polls, poll questions. Today, I'm going to get all three of our questions out of the way at the beginning. So if you're ready, we only have a few minutes to get started. Here we go. The first question is going to come up. How did you hear about this EnviroHouse wor uh, workshop? So please answer uh, in this poll. I'll give you about 20 seconds, 30 seconds to go through it. Looks like, oh yeah, Enviro News. A little bit of Facebook. Okay, I'm going to give you about four seconds. Three, two, one. Let's take a look at those results. We can always share the results. So it looks like a lot of you got it through Enviro News email, which is great. Hopefully, we can get some more uh, advertising budget to get some of those other places up. Okay, I'm going to stop this one and then I'm going to go ahead and ask the next question because it is pertinent to what we're doing. First question is How familiar are you with Northwest native plants and native habitat? Now, I've been in and out of the Northwest most of my life. But to be specific about the habitat and the native plants, I couldn't tell you what's native and what's what's not, what's invasive. So go ahead and answer your question. What what level of familiarity you have with these things? I'll give you about 10 more seconds to answer this question and get those results. And then we'll turn it over to Gail in just a moment. All right, so here's what this looks like. Somewhat but anxious to learn more. Excellent. It's most everybody here. No, no most common plants, but ready to up my game. Awesome. All right, and then we have one more question that we're going to ask so we can get going here. Oops. And that is, have you ever attended a Washington Native Plant Society event? I have not. I would like to. All right. Looks like I'll give you about 10 more seconds. Please answer, you know, vote early, vote often. All right. Just kidding. Uh, those of you just joining us, uh, don't forget this webinar is being recorded and we can play it back. We'll have the links there at the end of the, at the show here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the polling. 
and here's what we take a look at. Now, before I do turn it over to Gail, I'm going to say one more thing to remind everybody. Please make sure that you um, put your questions in the Q&A or into the chat. We will have a, the whole presentation by Gail, and then she'll be able to answer the questions at the end as a Q&A at the, at the end. So, all right. Without any further ado, <laughs> let's introduce Gail Sklar. Thank you for being here, Gail. Go ahead and take it away. Okay. Janda, are you going to introduce her? Uh, okay, so um, I just wanted to mention that um, we have been doing a lot of um, webinars and workshops with, well, this is actually our first webinar, but we've done several workshops with the Washington Native Plant Society. And Bill Brookerson, who has um, done most of the previous ones, um, and then Gail has done one at the Enviro House. This will be her second time with us. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Gail is um, the Vice President of the State Board of the Washington Native Plant Society, and she's also um, the Vice Chair of the South Sound chapter, which covers Pierce, Thurston, That's pretty and just it. that. And mm -hmm. she's the uh, Vice Chair of the Pierce Group. So it's a really good website to get a lot more information. We'll put that um, link in the chat so you can get that in the future, but it's really easy. It's just WMPS.org. And then you can link to the South Sound um, chapter from there. Gail is also um, a native plant steward um, and a, native, a steward at the China Lake Park on 19th Street. So very involved, knows her native plants, um, and has done a lot of um, gardening and also on the side she's an orchid grower so <laughs> lots of lots of good experience here to bring to you so gail if you have anything else to add to that um feel free um, i'm also a master gardener and a retired teacher of 44 years so um working hard to learn all the plants from the pacific northwest i'm an um, immigrant here from the east coast and um went through the Master Gardener program there and went through it again here and signed up to learn more about the native plants and have fallen madly in love with them. So I'm looking forward to presenting to you today and answering questions. And I'm so happy to have you here on this beautiful morning wanting to learn more about the native plants of Western Washington. Okay, well, I am going to take me off screen and um, we will get started. I'm also going to take me off screen if I can here. Um, so we're, today's talk is about gardening with native plants and I'm presenting through the South Sound chapter of the Washington Native Plant Society. And thank you for being here again and here we go. I am not advancing. So I'm going to stop for a moment and see why I am not advancing here. <clears throat> I'm going to go back, take one step back and redo this. Okay, no worries. And see if we can go again here now. Here we go. There we go. So what are native plants? why use them, how to use them, and which ones to use, and where to get more help and information. These are the topics that I'll be covering here today. So first, what is a native plant? What is a definition? And a native plant or ones or is one that was growing here in this area prior to the arrival of the Europeans. And how do we know this? We know this from the indigenous peoples who lived here before we, in, we invaded the area, so to speak. So which of these, these is not a Northwest native? So take a moment. You can put your answers in the chat if you like, and we can have a little interactive one, but uh, just because a plant grows in the wild doesn't mean it's native. 
And unfortunately, we're seeing fat foxglove growing in the woods. And every time I see them, I have to yank them out. They're very pretty and they're very decorative, but we don't want them where they don't belong. Fireweed is very pretty flower all the way on the left. It's called weed, fireweed, but it's really not a weed. It's a plant that is opportunist. And after a fire or after you've taken out a lot of Himalayan blackberry, this is one of the first plants that will appear on its own. So why use native plants? It's a good question. So I'm gonna answer this. So why is Souk, British Columbia of interest to those concerned about native plants? So does anybody wanna put something in the chat? And I cannot see the chat right now. So I'm just gonna go ahead, oh, here it is. Um, it is said that a homesick man brought to his garden a reminder of home. And look at what that reminder has done. If you drive down the I-5 corridor, it's all over. Um, so it is, it has invaded the area. It started as a single plant and look what happened. It's all over the place. And as I drive through Far Crest and Tacoma, I see more and more of these. And there is a debate about how to get rid of them. It's very important to cut them before, cut them down before the flowers go to seed because the flowers have a lifespan of 40 years. So you'll be combating it with little seed starts for 40 years. And Scotch broom is a Washington State Class B noxious weed. Plants officially listed as noxious weeds are harmful to humans, animals, or the natural ecology. You may not have heard of other noxious, you may have heard of other noxious weeds such as mil milfor, purple loosestrife, or tansy wart. Noxious weeds may spread aggressively and damage wildlife habitat. So what happens is when you have the scotch broom growing over, over an area, the native plants can't grow. They, these plants, scotch broom, emit a chemical that kills other plants. It's plants that would be competing for water or nutrients from the soil. So you really want to get rid of them quickly. Plants are being added to the noxious weed list all the time. Um, but some, such as foxglove, are not such a severe problem. But you have to, if you grow them in your garden, just try to control them uh, before they go to seed. So here it is, Washington State Class B noxious weed. Look at that. And as you drive down the highways in I-5, you'll see them. A study at Cornell University estimated that invasive species, plants, animals, and microbes cost American businesses and taxpayers at least $122 billion every year. The kicker to this tale is that most plant invaders are ornamentals. We brought them here not to feed ourselves, but to beautify our yards. And I have no problem. I, I plant natives and non-natives in my garden, but I'm very careful that the um, plants that I put in that are non-natives are not going to be aggressive growers. So there are many invas invasions occurring around us. Herb Robert is really pretty, little pretty pink flowers, and it has a rather it's been called Stinky Bob as a nickname. And um, if you pull it and smell it, you know why they call it Stinky Bob. Um, purple loose strife, some people really love it. It is a pretty plant. I had it back east, but I will not plant it here on the West Coast area. And then Japanese knotweed that was brought in um, and it just has taken over everything. So which of these plants is not a problem? English ivy, a butterfly bush, or a junga? 
all very pretty. Okay, so what do you guys think? I'm going to, now I found the chat, I'm going to peek in and see if anybody has answered that. Um, and no guesses uh, yet here. We're <laughs> okay. Any answers in the chat? I'm going to depend on you, Gator, to tell me what the answers are. Oh, someone has uh, put in Ajuga. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Ajuga? Yes. Okay. Good guess. That would be my question. That would be my choice. Okay. Too. Anybody else? Yep. Another Ajuga. Another vote. Two more votes for Ajuga. And then someone Butterfly Bush with a question okay. mark. Okay. So here comes the answer. Which one is not a problem. Here comes right? the answer. Um, oops, I went too far. Oh, no, I didn't. The answer is coming. And um, here's English ivy. It's mother's native vegetation. At Snake Lake or Tacoma Nature Center, I was working uh, pulling English ivy there. They meet the first and third Fridays of every month from 9 to 12, um, if you'd like to volunteer, if you have the time. When we pulled out the English ivy, up popped a native coral root orchid. So that was pretty amazing. And the butterfly bush is found along roads like Scotch broom. And even the ones that they have bred to be sterile, they revert back to being fertile. So there was not uh, successful sterilization of those. So um, they're very invasive and they really don't, well, the bees might go to them or the butterflies may collect some pollen. They don't feed any of our native pollinators, uh, babies or offspring, the caterpillars or such. And here's a junca which has escaped to natural areas. So the answer is they're all invasive. They're all a problem. So, um, I have a, a neighbor up the street. I've told her that they're invasive, but she says they're pretty and I like them. So there you go. So why use native plants in the garden? So they save water. And in the summer, you know, you, you, have to water a lot. And the best time actually to plant native plants is in the fall. I know we all get so excited at spring, we all have to plant everything. I'm as guilty as the next person. I'm busy planting things, which means I have to water more. Um, <clears throat> and I'm planting native and non-natives, but mostly natives to fill in now. Um, but when you plant a native and you plant them now, you have to water them in because they have to get established. And just because they're native and you put them in the ground in the summer, if you don't water them, they will die. So you have to be careful to make sure that they will get water. Another reason is they save time and money. You don't have to use fertilizers on natives and you sure don't have to use pesticides. And one thing to be aware of is to know which pests or helpful pests and which ones are the bad guys. So another reason is they benefit the environment. They protect regional water quality because they clean the water and they, can, they also offer control of steep banks. And some of us have semi-steep banks in um, this area, but not everyone. They also benefit wildlife for food, nesting sites, and cover. And I want to believe that this little squirrel is a Douglas squirrel and not a, a gray squirrel, which is not a native squirrel here. But they really feed our native pollinators. Uh, Doug Tallamy um, wrote a book, Nature's Best Hope, and he said, um, um, a new approach to conservation starts in our yard. So the more natives we plant, the better it is for our native pollinators because we've lost 70% of our insects and they feed the birds. So we've lost an awful lot of birds and not just the cats. 
And another reason to use native plants is because they are beautiful. And I'm going to be showing you some beautiful samples of them. Look at this. This is a back east. We call these a Turk's cap. But this is a beautiful, beautiful lily. And look at the berries on the salal. And I've had uh, tasted some uh, salal jam. So you can actually use these. The indigenous peoples use these for food and all kinds of things and crisps. We can use them in jams and such. And look at the color, look at the fall color. Just stunning. And these are the piggyback plants because the little leaves are coming up on the other leaves. And the color is a little pink on the tips over here. Just lovely. So how do you use native plants? Well, you want to plant right plant, right place, just like with any other plant. With tomatoes, if you plant a tomato in the shade, you know you're not going to get any tomatoes. So it's the same thing with native plants. And you can go to a native plant sale, which we're not having in person this year, uh, and find advice on native plants. And in the chat, Janet is going to uh, publish a list of books that I use as resources uh, to help me when I'm doing my planting, when, when I'm developing who, where, what I'm going to put where. Excuse me for the stutter there. So you need to know the place you want to plant. Are you planting in sun? Are you planting in shade? Are you planting in a wet area? Are you planting in a very dry area? And you can select wonderful native plants from any of that groupings. So you need to know what the plant is and what it needs. So once you know the place, it helps you to find the plant. And you, oh, the important, one thing that's so important is to know the plant size at maturity. That cute little shrub that you plant right at the base of your sidewalk. I see a lot of Japanese maples being planted. They aren't native here, of course. They do well here and they grow and they hang over into the street and hang over into the sidewalk because while they're tiny and little when you plant them, they do grow, of course. So you don't wanna put something that's gonna to grow too big near a fence, near a curb or near your driveway, right on the edge of your driveway. And some of these are just planted much, much too close to the fence. They need to come out almost to the edge of where the grass is. And what happens when you plant them too close, they're over the sidewalks, as you see here. So Pacific Rhododendron, Evergreen Huckleberry, some of these are pretty well behaved. They don't get out of control. Um, snowberry will spread and so will false lily of the valley. I, uh, I made a mistake of planting a snowberry too close to um, a peonia. So even ex with my, and that was before I knew as much as I know now. So I'm not going to beat myself up about it. I just have to make the correction in the fall. I'm not going to transplant now because it'll be too upsetting to the root system. Fringe cup is a very pretty plant. Some self seed very regularly and like, and also nodding onions. And I actually like false lily of the valley on as a ground cover in some parts of the area. So, but it is, it's not evergreen. So beware of that. And red sorrel is so pretty in the shade, but when you put it in the sun, it, it will fry. And also something to be aware of is when you look at plant labels, if it says full sun to part shade, that means it doesn't like the afternoon sun here, it will fry it. So be aware that um, a lot of people think when full sun, that's number one, so it can handle full sun. 
but you have to know how to read the labels. Uh, Red Dog os Osir and California Wax Myrtle, just so beautiful. They're not as picky about the light and will grow either in sun or shade, so they're pretty easy going. But then you also need to know what are the soil requirements for these. Some plants are very picky. Bunchberry needs a rich humus soil. Salal, on the other hand, tolerates poor soil. And they can grow pretty big because it's sort of like a shrub. It is a shrub and it's not just the ground cover. When it starts, it's low growing. Um, so how can you use these plants in your garden? How do you incorporate them? So if you know the right plant, right place rule, basically design considerations apply to any type of gardening. So whatever you've learned about ornamentals apply to natives as well. So how specifically can you use these in your garden? Add a single native to your garden and you can change the whole look. Here is a red Oser dogwood and here's penstemon. And there are many different varieties of penstemon. So read when you go to the um, plant store or plant markets where you're buying the, check them out and read. There are a lot of hybridized forms of penstemon but we also have native forms, which are a little hardier. So here you can mix natives and non-natives. You have penstemons, evergreen huckleberries, sword ferns, subalpine, subalpine spirea, and they look really pretty, all on a slight slope. And then here you have um, penstemon salal, Kinnikinnik and beech strawberry, all mixed in with other plants that are not native to the area. And it looks very pretty together and they fill them beautifully. You can use them along sidewalks or pathways or parking strips. And here you have bunchberry, maidenhair fern, and evergreen huckleberry. And over here, there's the woolly sunflower and lupin. You can use them as a hedge or fence substitute. Rhododendron, Indian plum, red elderberry, inside out plant or um, Vancouver eye, uh, an evergreen huckleberry. And here, tall Oregon grape. Tall Oregon grape, if your soil isn't, is appropriate for it, can be a good deterrent for people coming into your garden because they're sticky. They'll get you. <clears throat> Columbine, sword fern, deer fern, and false lily of the valley. Look how pretty that all looks together. You can create new native plant emphasis in areas. And here on the right, we have great false Solomon seal, oxalis, Pacific rhododendron, and hooker's fairy bells. And you can even Plant some of these in pots on your deck and they will look quite lovely. Besides the harebell here, you can try um, Louisiae, small penstemons, alum roots, nodding onion, larkspur, sea blush, or even shrubs like evergreen huckleberry when they're small. And what you might want to do is every, every other year or so add more potting soil to the pots, and when they get big, you transplant them into your garden. And back here, you can see the native columbine. And I wanna add, and it comes up later too in the talk, that if you have non-native columbines, they often cross-pollinate and you lose the native. So now we get to the question of which ones. Um, well, here we have Louisiae, Sedum, Pensum, and I already talked about this. 
Sorry, I anticipated and talked about it ahead. Um, the Oregon iris mine is blooming right now. It's just beautiful. And you have bunch grass, which is native for a little bit of color. And the tiger lilies, which we saw earlier. Back east, we call them Turk's cap. Um, but they're not. So which one should we use? And you can choose any kind that you like. It just depends on what you like, what light you have, your soil. And here they even have fawn lilies in this one. Just really quite lovely ornamental gardens made out of using native plants. And you can do, here is um, a Louisii Tweedii, and it's really pretty, but they grow on the east side of the mountains. So what that means is you can't plant them in really humus soil. So you see they're here in, um, in gravel. I've planted some on the front of my yard, and I've pulled them up and I've put gravel underneath where I've planted them and all around them. And amazingly enough, they have survived our wet winters because it's good drainage there and because of the gravel. Over here is the nodding onions. They don't last too long, but look how pretty these allium are. And these are the harebells and native penstemons, just really, really amazing. So there were over 250 Pacific Northwest native plants that are suitable for the garden. And keep in mind that the ones in the east are not always as suitable because the environment and climate is so very different on the eastern side of the Cascades. So you have to know what your garden situation is. Shady, again, right plant, right place. This is what this is referring back to. Sunny. Partial sun and shade. Is it a wet area? So for shady areas, look how pretty this can be. Um, you have red sorrel in here. And the red sorrel has pretty little white flowers. You have trillium. And you have maiden here. And over here you have the Pacific bleeding heart and they will spread like crazy over an area by rhizomes, but they disappear in, in the fall and winter. You have low Oregon grape growing in here, and back here is the sword fern, and they are so magnificent. So here's a sample of one shade garden that we saw, but a little more, a, more cl a closer view of it. So the Trillium ovatum is in the lily family and um, almost everybody recognizes um, the delicate Western Trillium and out at, um, in Oak Harbor or Grace Harbor, excuse me, at Lake Sylvia in, in uh, the end of March, beginning of April, they often have a Trillium count in which you can drive out there and um, see thousands of trillium. They counted well over a thousand trillium just in one, a couple hours out there. So they're pretty amazing. And they're one of our early spring woodland wildflowers. And like other natives, these should never be dug in the wild. So if you're tempted, you see a pretty one and you want to dig up a native plant, please refrain from doing that. Um, and you should not collect seeds. It can take seven years for a plant, a trillium ovatum, to go from a seed to flower. Some nurseries carry non-native varieties of trillium. So be sure to ask what you're getting. And, and some of the people at the um, nurseries may not even really know. So it's best to buy from native plant nurseries. And if you go to, um, WNPS.org, they have a source on their website for native plants and seeds. And we have a wonderful native nursery in Gig Harbor called Woodbrook. 
So as the trillion flower fades, it turns pink and then purple leading many people to think it's a different flower. In fact, there is a Facebook page for native plants, which you're, you can join. And um, there were questions as why was the trillium turning so purple this year? And since they always turn purple, it may be that they just, people have been busy working and not coming home and seeing their gardens quite the same way since we've been home due to COVID. So here is the redwood sorrel close up. Look at the lovely little flowers. And they spread by little, um, if you dig them up, there's like these little cute little sources of, um, it's not actually a seed or a rhizome, but it, it's very sweet uh, way of growing. And you can grow these even in pots and they'll cascade down. They're quite lovely. And here is the trillium. And here's a maidenhair fern. And it's just a lovely fern. And you can actually capture some of the spores on the back and propagate these with a little bit of uh, reading and knowledge. It's kind of fun to do. It takes quite a few years. And here is our native bleeding heart, which is so lovely. And this is all in like a woodlands setting underneath. It looks like dug fir bark to me here. So here's a close up of the bleeding heart. Here is a close up of the seeding, a fruiting uh, low Oregon grape. Once it flowers and then it turns in the berries and our birds just love them. And here is a sword fern. In fact, you can divide them when they get really big too. And then have more sword ferns. Here's the trillium ovatum in different forms of coloration. So the light pink one back here came right before this one. You can see them beginning to turn pink on the very edges. And here is a deep purple color. So as they fade, somebody once said, that's what happens when they pollinate, but it's really the fading time. And this is Oxalis oregana and they have two different colors. And the sword fern, Polystichum munitum, excuse me, the licorice fern, which grows on um, tree bark, or it's like on a tree that's fallen. You can see it here growing in the moss and it's on a, a tree, a tree bark. And uh, the triangular wood fern, you can see the shape of it. And here's a maiden form fern, which is fern, which is very pretty. It cascades down. I use these in a really shady area coming out of uh, sliding glass doors on my property. There was a, when I moved in, there was um, English ivy there. So I dug that all out and I put in ferns and they just are happy, very happy there. They don't need really any water except when it gets really, really dry. If we've had a heavy drought, I will water them once every few weeks. And there are two forms of the Dicentra formosa. There's an alba form. So you'll see Dicentra formosa. And then after that would be a small letter V and it says alba. But this is the most common form, the pink one. And low Oregon grape. Here's the flower form and here's the berries. And there is three names for the Oregon grape. The common name is Oregon grape. Some people call it Mahonia nervosa. It's also known as Berberus nervosa. And there's a bait between botanists as to what is the correct name. And it goes back to the DNA. So I'm not gonna get involved in that battle with those guys. So again, which native plants? And I'm gonna show you some more native plants for shady areas. Here is the white, here is the uh, salal in the different forms. Here is the flower of it. And it sort of looks like almost a bleeding heart, the little heart, but it's different as you can see. It's growing on a whole completely different shrub. And here is the fruit. Beaked hazelnut. 
I had a volunteer that I transplanted um, and it's very fast growing and you'll never get the hazelnuts because the birds get them first. And here's different stages of it. You can see the little beginnings, the little flowers come out and inside is the fruit, which is the nut. The devil's club is very pretty, but it has spines on it. So you don't want to grab that at any point for any point, but the berries are poisonous for us. Wildlife loves it. Red huckleberry. And you see it's growing on an old stump of a tree here. These old stumps provide food for other, for licorice fern and red huckleberry. And here are the red huckleberries. And false lily of the valley. It has a broader leaf. The um, other form of lily of the valley is more upright, narrow, um, narrow at the tip, narrow, and it's the leaf doesn't lie flat. And I love it as ground cover because I get less weeds to deal with. Wild ginger and um, the flowers grow underneath the leaf. So you very carefully look underneath the leaves and there they are, just so pretty. Little brown flower, very different. And I'm forgetting to look at my notes because I must know this by heart. And here's a vanilla leaf. Look at that. You can't make vanilla from this one. Vanilla comes from orchids, but quite amazing. And the flowers are just so pretty. And our pollinators, our insects, just love these. Here's a foam flower. And some forms of foam flower, and I have one that's supposed to be native, has some color on the leaf. It's a variegated, it has a little bit of um, maroon color in the leaves, but they're so pretty and they sort of look like um, foam coming out if you have a cluster of them growing. And they can reseed themselves and spread. Here's piggyback plant. And they called that, you can see the leaves are growing on the top of the other leaves. That's why they call it piggyback. And look how pretty, almost looks like a little butterfly inside here. And these little sections and the lines actually help guide the pollinators in for pollination, the insects. Now, sunny areas. Um, and we, some of us are lucky enough to have some sunny areas because people take down trees. So here they are. You can see this is a little square area. We have um, columbine in here, the native columbine, and it's always the orange and yellow. There is the camas and the Native Americans, if you go out to the prairie in South Sound, they're just blooming like crazy right now. They have prairie days uh, once a year. Um, and hopefully next year it will be up for everyone. And the Native American, Americans would burn the field and dig up the uh, roots and use them for food. But I went out to see the, des the uh, prairie when I took a native plant steward class, and it was just so stunning. Just acres and acres everywhere you look, blue camas. And here's the Oregon iris. And here is a sunny rock garden where you can see just beautiful native plants. This is alum root. And the leaf structure is quite lovely and they do not bloom all summer, but they're quite lovely when they're blooming. So it's nice to have a series of plants that are blooming throughout the season so that they give food to the native pollinators, the birds, the insects. Here is a broadleaf stone crop. And there's a lot of plants labeled as stone crop as you go to nursery centers, some which are native and some which are not. And it's fun to grow them together. And here's Tweety's Louisii, which I cannot say how much I love them, but I also have other Louisii, which are pink and red, and I have them growing near each other 
And it's just a striking, striking combination in my, in my eye. And everybody's eye for beauty is a little different. Here's a Davidson's Pensamen growing in this rock garden. Look how pretty they are. Colors are just lovely. And the Western Columbine again. And the common camas, here it is, all out there just, if you can imagine acres of it, it's just beautiful. And the squally, if you get down in the squally, you may be able to see them now. Um, and remember, the camas is a form of lily. And it was one of the main food stays for Northwest Native Americans. And like many bulbs, it likes a moist soil. So it grows here on the western side, not so much the common camas on the eastern side. So it, the, the uh, Latin name was right up here, Camasia quamish. Here's the Oregon iris, iris tenex, and it comes in two forms, the purpley, and here's the alba form. Both forms I found find to be lovely. And again, if you look at this, here's that landing strip for the insect directing it right in to where they will pollinate. Here are alum roots, and they're heuchera. So all those fancy heuchera that we have out there, the corabels, the purple and the greens and all the various colors, here is the native form of it. And these are different kinds of penstemon different colors, different shapes. These are all natives. So if you like them, you can look up Pensum in some of the books and, and search out which ones might grow in your community, in your flower bed, in your garden, which is what I mean by your community, your plant community. And here's more of the Louisiae, and I have a lot of these, Cotledon, and I have the Tweety Eye, and I have all these. I have all of them, actually, because I, I can't decide which one I like better. They're just all so pretty together, and they're blooming like crazy now. And here are more of the sedums, and each one has its own name, and these are the species and the natives. So now more native plants for sunny areas the trees, the mountain hemlock. And this is quite a lovely one. If you don't fertilize uh, these, the mountain ones, they will stay small for home gardens. You don't fertilize it and water it a lot. So keep that in mind. If you fertilize it and water it, it will grow big. So this mountain hemlock is very close to a window. If this this individual fertilizes it or waters it a lot, it will just completely obfuscate. It will grow wide and it will need more, more and more water. The roots will come out all over the place. So, but not necessarily in a bad way. Here is the shore pine, which um, I'm busy planting a lot of at China Lake because they can handle dry areas and they don't grow as dense as some of the others. And they have very interesting cones as well. And the Oregon grapes or Mahonia or Barbaris, whichever ones you want to call them, this is a tall one. And um, we have some at China Lake, but they're not doing well. So I know someone who's good doing his doctorate on Barbaris and asked him about it. And he said that if it's a heavy clay soil, they won't do well. They need a different kind of soil. So um, we won't be planting any more of them out there with China Lake. So keep that in mind. I was not aware of that. And every, I, I constantly am learning new things. So we all need to, we all need to uh, continue um, learning and researching things. Now, mock orange is just so beautiful. Um, Philadelphia's Louisii, and it's in the hydrangea family. And it, the more sun it gets, the more flowers it gets. Mine, unfortunately, I have three of them that were 
plant it underneath a um, ornamental crab apple, but they bloom. And then I have a uh, variegated form that I bought at a plant sale a few years back. And I have a dwarf, so you can get them in many shapes and sizes, but they smell fat. They just smell marvelous. And um, here's the service furry. And in Canada, they call them Saskatoons and they make Saskatoon pies and all kinds of yummy things out of them. And the flowers are beautiful, but you have to hurry and get the berries before the birds do if you wanna have some Saskatoon pie. Uh, here is California wax myrtle. And here a picture of it flowering. Not necessarily the most beautiful flower some of us might have seen, but here's the fruit and great for wildlife. It can grow in the sun or shade and it can tolerate salt water spray. So it's a very adaptable plant. Here's speech strawberry and they make little tiny berries, strawberries, and they're kind of sweet, but you have to get them before the birds, bunnies, and other pollinators do. And some of times you can see them even pink. So they're pretty amazing. Here's Kinnikinnik, which is actually, it's a ground cover, but it's a shrub. And it can cascade down a wall. Um, but here's the flowers. And here are the berries. And um, the insects and birds, again, love these. And here's the nodding onions. It's a form of alum. I'm sure you've also seen the big alums, or many of you have, and check them out, the ornamentals. But um, these just spread and grow like crazy. And they're just really pretty. And they call them nodding because their heads are down. And when the, we get a breeze, they sort of bob up and down. They're really pretty. You can't see my hands. I'm moving my hands up and down. <laughs> um, here's a woolly sunflower. Look how pretty they are. And, um, or, or they're also called Oregon Sunshine. So you may see them for sale by the common name. And the blooms last a long time here. Butterflies are attracted, attracted to these. And they form a mat in a dry, sunny area. So if you have a dry, sunny area, it's a great plant for that area. Here are daisy or flea beans. And it's a funny name to call it a flea bane. These are in the aster flat family. And the flowers and the seeds are right in the center here. Um, so they're pretty, they're really pretty plants. And these are harebells, our campanula with tons of folia. And they're quite lovely. Um, they grow easily from seed. It's a long lasting nodding blue flower and they're a very dainty addition to the garden. And here we go with the great camas, which are really big. They're two to three feet tall. Sun to moist, so sun, they need moist soil in winter, but dry in the summer. So you don't have to water these in the summer. So it's pretty amazing. And the great camas is a taller version of the common camas that Native Americans dug from meadows. It can be quite showy in the garden, planted in the sun while it will have moist soil in the winter and dries out in the summer and you will have a lovely display. So now, what about those gardens which are partial sun and shade areas? So, and a lot of us have those. We get morning, some morning sun, but then shade in the afternoon. So here is a picture. And in here we have the inside out flower, which is also Vancouveri Alexandra. And it's part of the Barberry family, believe it not, or not. And you know, I think of Barberries as the ones with little thumb, uh, little thorns on them, but it really aren't. It doesn't have thorns on this. It's quite lovely. And so, uh, it's, it's deciduous and it spreads easily. And it's, um, there is a form that is evergreen, Vancouverite, 
Lancipedala, and it is a um, very slow grower. So if you want a quick flower, you can grow these and maybe even grow the slower grow, growing plant of Petala nearby so they will complement each other. Here is a foam flower growing in here. You can see it looks like a little white foam and fringe cup. So you can grow these close to each other and they're not unhappy being close to each other. They, like, they can share space and also the native columbine adding color to the whole area. Then we have partial sun here. Here's an oak fern. We have a vine maple growing over here in the back. And they have the little wing seeds here. And the wild ginger growing underneath because it has a lot of shade right there. And there's the maidenhair fern again. Fringe cup. And you can see the little pink edges of the of it coming out. Just a very pretty little addition. And I'm sitting here smiling because I just love them so much. Here's a Vancouver eye again, close up. And here's another form that's yellow. And here's the vine maple. Look at the color in the fall. And it's it's nice to when you're planting to think about not only which plants are going to be blooming through spring, summer, fall, and even winter, but what's going to give you winter interest and winter color in the fall. And, and um, the shape of the vine maple is also very pretty when the leaves all fall off. <clears throat> so more, now we're going to get, look at more native plants for partial sun and shade. And we have evergreen huckleberry, and this person is lucky enough to be harvesting them. I have a lot of flowers this year, so I have great hopes that I'll be able to harvest some. And the red flowering currant um, is just a magnificent plant. And um, in Europe, when they, the first specimen was sent there to England by David Douglas in the early 1800s, when he was here hybridizing, and collecting plant species. And it was so highly prized and cultivated there that they considered this one plant that he sent back to be worth the cost of the whole expedition. And hybrids developed over there have been shipped back to the United States for sale. And when they're blooming, the hummingbirds in March, you can see the hummingbirds all over them. And they follow the blooming cycle up from California through Oregon all the way up to Western Washington. And when you see them blooming, they say here in the talk, you can put up your hummingbird feeders, but I like to plant enough pollen, enough plants that they can use as pollinators so I don't have to. Um, but they also have a yellow one, which is really pretty, uh, a yellow. Current. And here is the Pacific Nine bark that grows really big and bushy. And mine is getting ready to bloom soon. But here's what the flowers look like. And there'll be bees all over these. Ocean Spray is a fabulous um, native plant. The color is beautiful. Um, it can grow in sun and shade. It's part of the rose family. It doesn't have the thorns. And it can grow to 10 to 15 feet. And it looks, uh, they call it that because it looks like a wave or ocean spray when it's in bloom. It's a very adaptable plant to either sun or shade. It makes a nice background. And now we can see the Pacific rhododendron, though many of us have all different colors, shapes and sizes of rhodes that have been hybridized. If you go to the Pacific, uh, the um, Rhododendron Species Garden in Federal Way, you can see some that have been collected from China. They're really quite beautiful. And the red dog, o do the red oyster dogwood, excuse me. Here it is spring, summer, and fall. Look at the color. 
Chano Lake, we took down a whole bunch of Himalayan blackberries, and there was this whole huge 25 foot spread of uh, red oaks or dogwood that had been hidden. The color was just beautiful in the fall. Snowberry, and they're not very tasty for us. And sometimes I've been told that the um, birds will eat them only when there's nothing else around, but I really like them. And here is the red elderberry, Sambucus racemosa, a lovely, lovely native plant. Indian plum is a shrub, or some people consider a small tree. And here's the little plum-like fruits on it. Very pretty color. Um, here is the orange honeysuckle. Uh, they can really spread, so be careful. Some people put them on the base of trees. That they're not dangerous to the tree, as is English ivy, but they're quite lovely. And bunchberry. And uh, uh, when you get a bunchberry, keep in mind that you want to get a fairly large one. If you get a little one, it sometimes can be difficult to um, get them started. And they're in the dogwood family. They grow to two to 10 inches tall, partial to full sh shade. They need humus rich soil. And plant it with plenty of decaying bark or rotting wood somewhere when it won't get walked on. It is semi deciduous and spreads by rhizomes by runners. The white flag flowers are actually bracts. So these are the bracts, and these are actually the flowers inside. And these are the berries. So they're pretty amazing. And twin flowers, which are so pretty. You can see out on trails, on parks. Um, we have a whole spread on the um, right-hand trail at China Lake. It becomes a lovely little mat of ground cover. They don't like to be walked on. They um, bloom above shiny green foliage, and they're quite lovely, very delicate. And the great fall Solomon shield, and you can see they look like little star flowers. This is the false one. And they're pretty in their own right. It's a native plant. Um, here is the star flower close up. Looks like a little star here, you see it. Here is goat's beard, and there's a male and female plant. I believe this is the female, and this is the male up here, and you want both if you want to have them pollinate and make little baby ones, little baby goat's beards. And they call goat's beard because it looks like a little beard, a little goatee on a goat. And here is, here are plants for wet areas. It can be natural or man-made. So if you have a water feature, they're happy there. Yellow monkey flower. Skunk cabbage, which some people think are just so beautiful. Other people don't like them because they smell, but they are stunning. And they're highly favored in England as exotic flowers in wetlands. If you go down to some of the wetland areas and hike around, you can see these are just like growing out of really moist soil. It needs wet to very wet. The flower stalk is surrounded by the spathe, emerges first, followed by very large leaves. And here's a deer fern, which also likes very wet areas. And here's a twinberry, which is a lovely plant. And sometimes you don't know what you're looking at until the flowers bloom but you can get hints from the leaves and sometimes even from the twigs. Believe it or not, in the winter, I took a course on identifying twigs. Um, here's a maidenhair fern again. And here is the flower stalk that comes up first and here's the spathe on the skunk cabbage. And here are the big leaves. So they sort of look like cabbage leaves, but I don't suggest you cooking with them. And uh, here's the lady fern. 
deer fern and oak fern. So you can see the different difference in the uh, structure of the fern. It helps you tell the difference between them. And here is the twin berry with the fruit. Looking up close, it has two little berries. So that's why they call the twin berry. Monkey flowers close up. They have the two different forms. And here's a Minulus louisii, which is pink. And here it is, Minulus uteris, which is yellow. So where do you get more information? Because I went through this pretty quickly. And every time I go through it, I see close-ups and get new features. So you can go to the Washington Native Plant Society page, and they have native plant inf information, education and materials, chapter activities, native plant sales. And um, this year, we, we haven't had a native plant sale in the South Sound chapter, which is usually held in Olympia. We're looking to see if we can have one for the fall, but now the state's opening up. It seems like everything is changing really rapidly. Um, but there are sites you can go to. And they also have, um, here's a page, and you can see, they tell you all that they have all different plant lists. And the website has actually been changed and this PowerPoint has, was put together. So explore it. You can go to chapters and see what South Sound is doing. Um, Meetup often has walks, which is a great way to learn about more native plants. Um, we have great plant leaders. Um, we have some self-guided walks um, that have plant lists that are up on our website now. So you can print out the plant list and go on the hike and see if you can identify them if you take along a Poger's book or one of the other native plant books. And they also have the um, Starflower edition. Um, King County has sources, University of Washington Herbarium is amazing. E Nature and Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center gets a lot of information. And they have its, um, and the King County, they also have landscape designs that you can copy. Um, they have plant lists for dry, shady areas, as we do on our website. And uh, you can also go to the Department of Fish and Wildlife or the National Wildlife Federation. And um, here are some sources of information. And again, Jana has put some books of my favorites that are going to be posted. And some of them are right on this list here. So don't worry about copying all that. And um, Conservation District has sales. The County Salvage Pro Program has sales. And we have that down in Thurston. In fact, I just got a whole bunch of plants this last weekend. And they're going to have another sale in um, the fall. So you might want to go to Thurston County Salvage and see what you can find. So here we go. And I went over my time and these are photographs, acknowledgements, and these are the gardens that were highlighted. People were kind enough to let us take pictures. And these are the authors of this presentation. And um, I'm going to put my video back on if I can get there. And uh, 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 I thought I'd jump in and help out here a little. OK, thank you there. Want to get my picture yeah. there? Uh, here I am. There we go. Here I am. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. There was so much information. I was swimming in it. It's great. So um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, it's been recorded so you can go back and, and listen again. That is right. So um, now that we got through that, um, and we have so much in our heads. We do have some questions that popped up during this. Are you ready for them? I am ready. Okay, first one, are there any good apps you recommend for to ID native plants on the spot? That's a cool thing. I, I didn't hear. Oh, are there any apps, uh, like phone apps, that you recommend to ID native plants? Yes, they do have apps, and I'm gonna pull them up on my phone. 
and um, they have um, the Washington native plant ID and that for trees and that does cost money to join. Um, it's a one-time fee. Um, you can join the I think the Facebook groups are pretty interesting because you can uh, learn a lot. Um, I've been trying to get back onto some of the apps here and I haven't been able to find a whole lot that are been really helpful to me. We have the Washington Wildflower um, um, app that you can look for. And then they have weed apps, but um, I haven't found any that are free that I can recommend. They also have iNaturalist, which is interesting. So you can see me looking down at my phone doing this now. Um, but uh, I love the Washington Tree app and the Washington Wildflower. It's called Trees, of the, Trees PNW, Trees of the Pacific Northwest. There's a one-time fee for that one. But it was well worth, I think it was $4.99 or $3.99. Excellent. Um, another question is holly plant a native to the uh, native to the Pacific Northwest? No, and they're very invasive because the birdies eat the seeds and then they go and pollinate them all over when they poop. So um, they were uh, brought here by the holly um, society because the uh, the um, commercial district they wanted to make it our native estate plant, but it's not native, so that didn't work, but they're very invasive, and when you dig them out, you have to make sure you get as much of the root as possible, because they will start shooting up from the roots. So, no, get rid of them. They're not, and, and they take over, and um, plant Mahonia, Barbaris, um, Oregon grape instead. <laughs> <laughs> Deck the halls with Oregon grape instead. Um, yes. the follow-up like question. That. Is Oregon grape, it looks similar to holly. Are they related though? Is that um, to my knowledge, uh, I'm not sure of what family holly actually belongs to. Okay. Um, but it is a berberus. And you see berberus growing in many forms, like the little round clumps with the little thorns on them. And when you get poked in the behind when you're weeding, you know you've <laughs> hit one. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions right now. Does anyone out there have a few, any questions to ask here at this point? Um, well, when you're, while you're talking about invasive sure. trees, the aspen at the Enviro House, I think that's the one that grows all over upper Colorado that has such a huge root system. Waking so Lake Aspen, yeah. They have spread everywhere. And since I haven't been there this year, I mean, since we're closed and I can't maintain it, we've got aspen tree starts coming up from underground into all of the raised beds. So I now have two raised beds full of aspen trees that I'm going to have to go dig out. And the Oregon app and some of the ash trees are also invasive. Now the birds actually get drunk on the berries. You can see them wobbling around in the fall when they finally, they fly in and in one day all the berries are going off the tree, but they are not native. And you have to, if you're going to plant a non-native plant that's an, a, aggressive, that will grow and spread, you have to be vigilant to keep it under control. So my, for me, as I'm getting older and I'm less able to do stuff, I don't want any of those aggressive plants. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question about dandelions. Uh, what about dandelions? Are they, are they native? Flowers are pretty and leaves are edible. They're the first uh, flower that are, um, oh gosh, the bees, the mason bees can pollinate with. The mason bees mm -hmm. don't go too far. Um, they're pretty assertive as to whether they're native. You know, I'm sorry, I can't answer that, but it's a good question. I'm going to have to research that. I know they're everywhere. I don't know if we brought them in or not, but um, you want to watch for them. I mean, some people hate them and some people love them. I have a friend said she was going to plant her whole garden <laughs> in, uh, in, in uh, dandelions. And uh, the lion's a little bitter and the greens can be a little tart. And I don't use them too much because I have a dog and I don't have a fenced yard. So other animals come in and um, 
they can water them with ways that I don't want to ingest. <laughs> so uh, be careful if you're going to eat, collect and harvest the dandelion. Wash them really well. <laughs> it, seems like, it seems like planting a dandelion garden is similar to planting a blackberry bush. They I'm just, not quite the same. <laughs> but I mean, you don't need to plant people. one. You don't need to plant a dandelion garden. They're just there. <laughs> and, and, if, and if, if you like them and you want to keep them, yeah. when the flower is gone and the seeds start to come, just cut off the seed heads. That's the, that's a neighborly way to do things. I have a neighbor who's got them growing in his cracks in the street and he doesn't want to get rid of them. Yeah. Uh, so I have them growing in my yard now, in my <laughs> un, un yard. I've gotten rid of all the grass as much as I can and I have Good. dwarf conifers and all natives growing in there. Nice. So Gail, we also had a question early on in the Q&A that was um, wanting to know how to get rid of ivy. And my response in the in the chat was dig it out because cut it down, dig it out, and just keep at it. And I don't know if it works, but I suggested possibly agricultural vinegar, which will work on other weeds, but it might not be strong enough for ivy. Uh, you don't want to. I don't use vinegar at all because it can harm the um, insects underground, and it's not usually strong enough. The and it's in the shade, and it's got. The uh, ivy has a very waxy coat on it, so it doesn't penetrate that. You've got to dig them out. Right now is a great time to dig them out because the soil isn't too hard yet. And um, if you've got them growing up a tree, so stay at the chest level and cut them, cut around them and pull them out down. You don't have to pull them off the top of the tree, but cut them because when they grow up, <laughs> they form, the leaf almost looks like it's a different plant and it starts to flower and then it gets berries and the birds come and eat them and then share the English ivy all over. So what you wanna do is make a life ring around a tree three to five inches wide so it doesn't start growing up again. But you have to be ever vigilant with those. Okay. I'll, I'll leave the ivy for Wrigley Field in Chicago. That would be fun. <laughs> Well, we have a lot of information in the chat. We've put in a bunch of um, references, books, and um, links to a number of different sources. And I hope those come up in the video. Um, if not, um, email us and I can, I can send that list to you. Um, and then I also put in at the end where to register for um, coming up, you can go to the EnviroHouse website or to um, check out the Sustainability Facebook page um, for the links to get registered. If people have questions for me, you can email me at the words vice president at wnps.org. Okay. So uh, I'll have direct questions. Um, so, and, and excellent. I just added that to the chat. That have been... Uh, um, saved on native plants at WNPS.org from the past year. This past April was Native Plant Appreciation Month and uh, also Native Plant um, Month for the whole country. And we offered 24 webinars so people could attend for free and they are, have been videotaped and archived so people can learn more there. And I'm going to sign up for some more webinars at the Environment House because. <laughs> well, join us on the 22nd for Growing Herbs. Um, and as I said, Jenny will be doing in June, she's going to do weeds, pests, and um, just garden landscaping issues, how to treat them with non-toxic solutions. Um, and you can find those things, any of these things you're talking about with plants and treatment, Check your local nurseries, the smaller places. The big box stores oftentimes don't have um, the non-toxic treatments and the plants aren't always um, either native or um, sometimes as reliable. So I encourage you to check your local nurseries and see what you can find there. And also check out Woodbrook for natives. Mm -hmm. and, uh, there are some, there's my cat in the background. The dog is at my feet. And so, if, um, if you let me throw in there, if you don't want to cross the bridge to go to Woodbrook, 
Um, Tacoma Nature Center has an ongoing native plant sale and they get the plants from Woodbrook at cost and then they sell them, I believe they sell them at retail, but that's a fundraiser for the uh, Tacoma Nature Center and they're located at um, 19th and Cedar. But they're not open yet. I thought she said they were doing that. Um, they I may know be. they're not open, but I thought she, well, you can check they their website. They have a plant sale there already, okay. I believe, and, they're, and they'll have one again in the fall. Well, we have one last question online. here. They, they, you cool. can order it online and they had curbside pickup, but they may be doing it in person in the fall, so that's very exciting now. Yeah. Well, we have one last question. Are there any common native plants that do not shed leaves during the winter? Well, yeah, we went through those. Um, ah, yes, there was some. We went through those, the, uh, the berries, the uh, huckleberries do not shed, salal does not shed, the um, ferns, some of the fronds will die back, but they don't necessarily shed leaves. And guess what? If you gather up those, if you leave those leaves in the bed, they break down and they really make your soil richer. So don't clean off the shedded leaves. You can also always take them, rake them up in the spring to a compost pile, I leave, I put them on my raised beds in the winter so that they, I get less weeds and they decompose and they're a great source of uh, compost. And another way of doing compost, and I do worms too, and Jana knows that because she, I watched her clean out a worm bin at one <laughs> point. Um, I also took a trash can and punched a whole lot of holes in it, keep the lid on it, and I can put even food scraps in it so we don't get any vermin in our yard. And it makes great compost. So if you go out to the Master Gardener's Demo Garden in Kualip, it's gonna be opening soon. They have a whole compost demonstration there. But the Environment Center's worm bin lessons are fabulous. Yeah. So go and, and see those. Are, those are on um the how-to videos, we have one on worm bins and on regular composting, and we will probably be doing a worm bin uh, webinar this summer. Um, and also, if you can see behind me in the picture behind me, that the Enviro House has a lot of the native plants that have been discussed here. Um, the grounds are not as immaculate, immaculate as we normally would have them because we've been closed for so long, but hopefully we're going to have that all spruced up and be able to have visitors soon. So. Well, Jenna, as long as there are weeds, we gardeners will never be out of a job. <laughs> That's, true. That's true. All right, well, let's wrap this thing up. I'm going to put up oh, our I video. Have one more point oh, to make. Sure, sure. When you're out weeding and you're saying, oh, these weeds, these weeds, so you're out weeding, there are, they have proven the New, New England Journal of Medicine published an article saying there are bacteria in the soil that actually elevates your mood. So it's a natural high and uh, <laughs> you can go out there and you're waiting, but you're making yourself happier. That's fascinating. I didn't yeah. know. Well, thank you, Gail. This has been wonderful. Yes, um, thank you so much. So um, we will have this up online for people to see in another week or whenever our media people can get to the point of having the time to put it up. So, and thank you all for attending and thank you for inviting the South Sound chapter of the Washington Native Plant Society to speak to, to everyone today, Jana. Everybody go to the website and sign up. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. We will uh, see you next time.